I'm really excited to be um, part of this and to see your faces tonight when all the world feels like wilderness to show up and know that we have people listening and talking with us. It's precisely what we want and we want to model that behavior. And I love seeing uh, everybody in the audience because it's kind of what we're shooting for, isn't it? We want uh, representation that looks like everyone around us that looks like reality instead of like one note. So thank you all for showing up. And I'm going to bring up Larissa Schmilo, who's going to give you some stats and data. And it's on these flyers that she's provided for you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, my friends. Okay, my friends, thank you so much for being here uh, today. Uh, you know the stakes for November 6th are very, very high. Um, healthcare, the social safety net, environment, women's rights. But don't let us think that activism or political, political involvement is meaningless. I mean, look what two women who cornered a senator in an elevator did. Anna Maria Arquila, Maria Gallagher, stopped the Senate for one full week on the Kavanaugh um, nomination. A full week. The Senate stopped because two raped women confronted a United States senator. That's power. And that's beautiful. Anyway, we have eight, eight um, avowed white supremacists are running for office in Congress. One card-carrying Nazi. Um, we need to flip the house, ladies and gentlemen, and we can do that. We need 23 seats. Amen. And we can do this, and we can do the Senate too. It's tough, but with turnout and with more registration, and you have until October 12th to register. If you're not registered here in New York, you can do it online if you have a, a driver's license. So I, I've left material on the tables for volunteer opportunities. You are poets, you are writers, you are artists. You are the, what is it, unseen legislators of the world. You might want to pick up the phone and call somebody in Idaho, call somebody in Indiana, call somebody in Florida, and get them to come out to vote. You can do this. Um, anyway, we can do this. As I say, two, two survivors have just stopped the United States Senate and got Jeff Flake, Flake to change his mind from voting, from voting immediately for... Uh, uh, for that hysterical man, my God, you know, maybe it was his time of the month. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm, I, that's all I've got to say. Um, we see involvement does have impact. Please, we have a president who is a confessed sexual predator. We've got to do something about it. <laughs> so, so anyway, let me let us go on with the show and. I'll give it back to Maggie. Let me introduce the lovely and talented Maggie Balistrieri. Where are you at, Maggie? MC Maggie Balistrieri at NYC Maggie is a namer and taxonomist and the author of the amazing Evasion English Dictionary, now in expanded edition. edition. She's also got, and the books are here. Our, our readers' books are here. Please buy them, all right? Um, it's hard to be a poet, you know. Please buy our books. Uh, she's also the author of a Bellastory collection, ABC Poems, and There Was a Young Lady Who Swallowed a Lie, uh, illustrated by Rin uh, Gargulinski. She also publishes as Matt Maud Speaks. Please welcome my amazing friend, Ma Maggie Margarita Bellastory. Thank you, John, baby. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, everyone. Women need 
need to understand under. Look, it was so long ago. He was so young. You have to stand under. This shit would ruin his life, all that he worked for. And for what? You have to stand under. It's important for women to try to stand under the pressure men face every day. I care. I do. It's just that this is so not the right time for this conversation. You have to stand under. I think women need to stand under the havoc this would wreak on a man's life. His life! Oh, you're not listening, and I'm just trying to make you stand under. Jesus Christ, I'm just not getting through to you. Are you even trying to stand under? Because I don't think you are. Sometimes, I think the problem is, women just refuse to stand under. This is from the book that Larissa mentioned, the Asian English Dictionary. Actually, there are many ways you can actually me. The hollow victory, actually. Translation, did you misspell Pyrrhic? Examples, actually, it's a trilby, not a fedora. Well, actually, you don't mean literally. You mean figuratively, no? Well, actually, you're not nauseous, you're nauseated. Unless, of course, you really mean the pleasant surprise, actually. Translation, my low expectation has been exceeded. Examples, actually, you're right. Well, mostly. You're funny, you actually just made me laugh out loud. I mean, it was a, it was a wedding, but actually, I, kind of had a good time. The low self-esteem, actually. Translation, yay, stupid me. Examples, huh, I actually like the way this looks on me. It went great, I actually contributed a few ideas. Things are good, great even? I don't know, I'm actually in a good place these days. Happy even? The damage control, actually. Translation, Join me in deciding this isn't a big deal. Examples. I actually don't have a copy of my resume on me, but you can just Google me. I would love to, and happy birthday to your cousin, but I'm... actually, I can't. No, actually, I didn't read the whole article, but that's not the point. What I'm commenting on, and really what I appreciate your response to, is the tone and just a general attitude. The self-soother, actually. Translation, control the narrative, control the narrative. Examples. Embarrassed? <laughs> Why would I be embarrassed? No, actually, I thought it was funny. In fact, nah, you know what? I'm relieved. I don't have time for that shit. So actually, it's better that I haven't heard back from her. Fuck her. I didn't mean to do it, but you know what? It had to be said. So in the long run, actually, I'm glad I replied all. And the diplomatic correction, actually. Translation, sir, no. Examples. I did actually turn it off and then turn it back on, so no, that's not it. So can you help? She, actually, my doctor's a woman. Anyway, what she said was... It was my first language, so actually, I'm pretty sure I pronounced it right. Bruschetta. Nice. Dear Dashel, Oops, I owe you an apology, Dashel and Asher and all your Williamsburg friends. I've been wrong to laugh at your name all this time. I'm sorry for directing derision at parents who get creative when naming their babies. You were easy targets, you Xanders and Lolas, you Joplins and Rockets too. It became a sport to pounce on Park Slope naming conventions. How we sighed as you regaled us with backstories. If you don't know that we mock, oh, we mock. And how is Rogue? I'm sorry for needing a mnemonic to remember your daughter's name. Hi, they live 108, she was in heaven, can't wait, Tierney. 
I'm sorry for laughing at Beatrix, Juniper, Calix, and Finn. How misfired my ridicule's been. And I'll stop soon. Because really, as far as names go, Pilot is heading in the right direction. <laughs> you think Gulliver's bad? Nah, we're just not used to it. But look at what we did get used to. Look at how inured we are to what was way more diagnostic of asshole. Yesteryear's christening trope of naming your son after yourself. If he's a boy, I'll name him after me. Thankfully, it's on the decline, that custom, that index fossil of the proto-egotistic era. I'm Don, this is Don Jr., and that's little Don. What? <laughs> so good for you, Andromache. Good for us all as well. Lovely to meet you, Blade. Can you forgive my stupidity, Salinger? And parents? Good job. Thank you for naming your child after your favorite writer, or burrow, or... What is that, a typeface? Fine. <laughs> Thank you for naming your child instead of echoing yourself. Because our primary problems favor juniors. Our major woes sound a lot of minor thirds. And for progress, I'm banking on Lyra. And every arrow parents launched beyond themselves. Find us a better path, dear scout. Guide us to truth, sojourner. Help us burn this shit down, Ember. And Dashiell, please hurry. And I'm sorry. I think I'll end with a couple of dictionary poems. Turn to a page in the dictionary and write a poem using only words on that page. And this is the page on which I think the word poem is defined. With a grunt, a shiver fit, the brusque fruit of mental noises mutters into language as if called through water. The page on which haiku is defined. Animal torment consists of the heart caught wild, a plea for her mouth. An oblique allegory for guidance. A word or phrase is spun by a drunk, a method of reckoning what is correct. Cast off skin akin to hollow feeling. Tramp in the slop bowl, spiritual gambling, draining chamber pots of slogan swill, to plod one's way, especially for those to whom the sense is familiar. And the last one. Sound a word, the first one that comes to mind without dwelling on details. Overcome obstacles with the assurance of something forthright. Too many woolly words without precision. Keep a promise, be responsive to one ordinarily accustomed to hiding. Thank you. And now I get to introduce Larissa Schmilo, is a poet, novelist, translator, editor, anthologist, and critic. Her new novel is Sly Bang, forthcoming from Spite and Dival in January 2019. She's the author of five poetry volumes and two poetry CDs. Her latest collection is Medusa's Country from Mad Hat. Schmilo translated Victory Over the Sun for the Los Angeles County Museum's landmark reconstruction of the Futurist Opera and edited the online anthology 21st Century Russian Poetry, and that's by Big Bridge. She's the winner of four New Century Awards for Spoken Word. Please welcome Larissa Schmilo. lying face down drunk on the floor of the subway train one heel lost and I feel a hardened man raping me 
my virgin soul frost. And awards are easy, Mama said. They may choose you, but they don't know you, Miss Boss. And my father says that I'm sexy and the time after that is lost. And I know, in fact, that I cost. And before she dies, Mama says she wishes I was never born. My death in my mother's eyes crossed. But my love, see this chasm and wall here and be brave for me. Come swim the swamp around me and trust it is not in me. Or if it is, come love this swamp creature until it is drained. And look at the dead in the moat, for here they will remain. And sit here still with me and I will haltingly explain I still love beyond barbs, beyond wounds, beyond pain. Dmitry Mirishkovsky uh, is a Russian critic. That's all you need to know. Uh, <laughs> actually, you know, he's Anna Karin, um Is Trace here? We we don't know. We don't know how to pronounce Iag. I, I'm told we can pronounce the wonderful Iag any way we want. Anyway, a version of this poem uh, uh, appeared in the wonderful Iag, and this is Anna Karenina in her own right. Me too. Ah, Mirishkovsky, to you I was a mare ridden badly by a man, and because of him, his error, I had to be destroyed. And Lev, my dear, you never gave me my own voice. You didn't dare. What did I talk about when I did talk, after all? Abortion with Dolly? Every damn thing Vronsky did that I did better? The problem was not that I was sexual. Men, you count on that. The problem was that I was smart. But sexual women must be killed. All the books attest to that. Mirskovsky permeates the consciousness of Slavic scholars, is the honest story still. But I thought you most, Lev. You knew soon well that the problem was not one woman, one man. It was all women, all men. You had Vronsky climb in society while I, damn, I even knew more about horses than him. I was the scarlet woman, though our offense was the same. Did I abandon my child, or did a martinet bar me from him? Ah, oh, she holds Rotsky back. Ah, the guilt. Oh, there is no talking to you. You sent me the dreams that haunted your ruling class sleep. A peasant with an iron. The proletariat that said, fuck you and your landlord's way of life. You killed me with the railroad built for you by them because you had to. Where was your resurrection then? You repudiated Karenina, it's true, but you abandoned me to my fate. And so, Lev, I still struggle a century and a half later to have my story told. And I'll... I will end in this, it's called um, When Poets Get Shot. Orange, the color of emergency, Trump's Mein Kampf has launched. Here come the Nazis, the pedophiles, the benevolent white supremacists, the rapists, the men who like their women bruised. Yes, Nazism has always had to do with violent and non-consensual sex. Orange prison uniforms for asylum seekers kept hungry and in cramped, dirty quarters, little babies ripped from their mothers, reference see Sophie's Choice. 1,500 border babies lost, no one knows where they are, probably in sex trafficking. See paragraph one. For you and me, orange uniforms? There is no surety that says no, and there you go to the camps, to the beautiful BASF or Dow or Monsanto chemical gas. Reference this way to the gas, ladies and gentlemen, by Tadeusz Borowski. Some authoritarian examples. In 1921, a poet dreaming of his wife in Abbas Ababa is brought before the firing squad and shot. During World War II, in Stalingrad, a clownish writer accused of espionage ridiculously dies of starvation trying to eat his prison mattress. Poets who died in the camps. Anika Cheney, Grazina Krastowska, Robert Desnos, Benjamin Fondane, Pavel Friedman, Peter Hammerschlag, Jakob von Hodges, Noor Inayat Khan, Max Jacob, Itzhak Katz Nelson, Peter Keen, 
Bertrand Colmar, Igor S. Korntire, Henrika Lazar Talent, Yakil Lehrer, Selma Mirban Isinger, Eric Musen, Anna Medell, Sarah Powell, Maurice Seeler, Augustine Susky, David Vogel, Ilse Lehrer. <coughs> Here in the US it will be me. I too will be called a spy and hauled to a dark site to be waterboarded. Not because I have any information, I don't. Just for stupid, sadistic fun. There will be a picture of Ivanka Trump on the wall and my torturers will force me to genuflect and pray to her. I mumble lines from my poetry, proud that they burned me, proud that I have told the truth. Then come the rats. Let's hear from Larissa Schmeiler. And do we have Trace in the house? Yes. Yeah. All right. Here we come. Trace Peterson is a trans woman poet critic, author of Since I Moved In, Chats Press, 2007. She's also founding editor and publisher of Eon, which has won two Lambda Literary Awards, including the first given in transgender poetry. She's co-editor of the anthology Troubling the Line, Trans and Gender Queer Poetry and Poetics. That's from Nightboat Books and co-editor of Arrive on Wave, Collected Poems of Gil Ott, Chax Press, 2016. Her second full-length book of poems is forthcoming from Asaka Press in 2020. Please welcome Trace Pierce. Woo! I just want to say to everybody here, I believe you. Thank you. <laughs> no one could see the vast crowd. This is a working sentence. Someone walks by. Three sentences standing around bonding. Terrible, terrible sentences. The third sentence presents the fourth sentence more than the fifth. Sitting in a late cafe, crying, trying to stare down carbs with the mistress's tools. A panoply of belated newsprint. A drain stopper with a dripping faucet. Coming in and coming out of the same entrance marked urgent. Paragraphs concealing whole illegal phrases. You marked me like this. Your flesh was a... Styrofoam packing glitch, my flesh was plastic rotary phone alimony. I carried about you into my term limits. No one could see the vast crowd. Is my protection really there? Is my storm drain a liar, I said, a lair? If you can hear the sound of my voice, if you can weep, who seek the quiet, non-quiet ingenue showing up with an awareness strapped to her back and frills and seasonless outhouse amending night. If you can swallow a horse pill, if you can correct the record so it flips closed, if you can barrel through the legislation with a fringe, pages and pages betray one another on a whim. Stand up to the breaker, maybe. The surface is grime, the spandrels a delicate balance, the fasces that made our avarice great. They entrap a womb to leverage many petty channels. Actually, I don't have a many petty lack. Resistance comes back. The tumbling Locrian meat house of our maker, our grower, our pretender. Very, 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 very. To flatten out the stomach acid, to paint the birds closed. A public forest of intangible treeless forms applauding their ascension. The recycled bin moves me to tears like a second chance for ampersand hearts. A lariat and a missile shield. What is this poem really about, Trace? Well, last week you died. You did. Everything was getting so concrete. 
I didn't know you were going to leave, and the medium was keeping us apart. A panoply of belated newsprint, sitting in a late cafe, crying. I discover just as you have become a signal running through a wire, signing off. People are not words or sentences. I hate social media. You were so positive, and I argued back continually. If the floor pulled out with each new memory blaming a distraction, how many more will die? When does the surrealism dry up completely? If you can hear the sound of my voice, tonight I'm at a protest march in the cold. In socialist realist syntax, I'm shouting up at a distant apartment window, trying to provoke any action from a complacent person in power. And this is also, these are both from uh, my forthcoming Asada book, but this one is uh, it's a later poem, and it refers to an earlier poem. It's called Coda, which is also the name of my ex-girlfriend. So, Coda. What used to be chivalrous is now unassertive. What used to be charmingly self-deprecating is now painfully self-negating. What used to be appreciated as supportive is now demanded and enforced at penalty of a heavy fine. What used to be tender is now insultingly condescending. What used to be considered a brilliant comment is now acceptable provided a nearby male approves it and agrees. What used to be a witty conversational reposte is now aggressive or even violet. What used to be shit doesn't stink. What used to be intimacy is now sitting in the waiting room, a nicely decorated waiting room with flowers, wasps, piped in smooth jazz, and terrible magazines. What used to be terrifying is now harmless. What used to be what used to be is now another person's life. What used to be the complex development of a long heroic building's roman is now the days of our lives meets hot in Cleveland meets alien. What used to be an idle theory or idea is now showing up as the proof of my discourse, which changes what had been initially meant, that I am not in fact a discourse or a theory or an idea, but someone other than those things. What used to be self-consciousness is now the necessity to always remain alert. What used to be basic kindness is now flirting. What used to be exclusion is now perky failed exclusion. What used to be poetry is now poetry. What used to be expertise or knowledge or experience is a swarm of ambient words he barely hears looking deep into your peerless eyes. What used to be humiliating is now strengthening, emboldening. What used to be human is now reframable. What used to be water is now steam. Thank you. Thank you, Trace. Patricia Spears Jones is a poet and winner of the 2017 Jackson Poetry Prize from Poets and Writers. She is author of A Lucent Fire, New and Selected Poems, that's from White Pine Press 2015, which was finalist for the Poetry Society of America's William Carlos Williams Prize and the Patterson Poetry Prize and featured a Pushcart Prize winning poem. She is in anthologies such as Of Poetry and Protest from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin, Bax, which is Best American Experimental Writing, and 2016, 2017 Pushcart Prize, 41. She received residencies at Virginia Center for Creative Arts, Yaddo, the Rauschenberg Center, and Camargo Foundation in Cassis, France via the BAU Institute. Please welcome Patricia Spears Jones. I feel strange. I feel short. Okay. <laughs> because I am short. Hi. Uh, I'm going to reiterate the reason why we're here tonight. November 6th is Get the Vote Out Day. Vote blue. Do not sit in your house, apartment, trailer. I don't care where you live. Get the fuck out and vote. All right? We, this is 
this is not, you know, yes we can. This is, we want to live. <laughs> so, and that's true. And you can, we can all sit here and go, uh, but it's very true. It's even true here in, you know, New York State, where we have some Republicans who don't want to, you know, I don't know, maybe like, you know, really deal with the fact that reproductive rights are under attack on some other things that have to do with, you know, being women. And, uh, or educators. Like, when was the last time anybody who worked for CUNY got a real serious raise? Oh, Thank you. So, vote. Get your friends to vote. Call your family in Pennsylvania. Get them to vote. I don't care what you have to do. Beer, whatever. Get them to vote. So, I'm going to read uh, at least one poem by Polly Murray, who is an African American poet. She was also an incredible activist. She was a co founder of Now. She. Um, did just about everything you could do between 1920 uh, and 1977, which was, or 81 when she died, uh, including becoming an Episcopal priest, the first, the first cohorts to do so. In 1943, she wrote this poem called Mr. Roosevelt Regrets, Detroit Riot, 1943. has an epigram. Upon reading PM newspaper's account of Mr. Roosevelt's statement on the recent race clashes. Quote, I share your feeling that the recent outbreaks of violence as widely spread parts of the country endanger our national unity and comfort our enemies. I am sure that every true American regrets this, unquote. What you get, black boy, when they knock you down in the gutter and they kick your teeth out and they broke your skull with clubs, and they smet and they bashed your stomach in. What you get when the police chop you in the back, and they chain you to the beds while they wipe the blood off? What you get when you cry it out to the top man? What you get on the, what you, when you call on the man next to God, so you thought, and ask him to speak out to save you? What the top man say, black boy? Mr. Roosevelt. Regrets. Uh, Dark Testament has just been re-released and it's an amazing book. Um, Room Behind the Room, this was in uh, an anthology called um, Speaking Truth to Power. The Room Behind the Room, which I had a different title for, but the editor didn't like it, so I changed it. I still regret that, but you know, what can you do? The Ethel police force was used to ensure the funeral of the phoenix left behind in a room behind the other room where the doctors met and talked about football. But that is the story told by the good elders of the forever praising his name church, even if his name is not actually called. They wanted to hang her or burn her, the woman in the room behind the room, where the doctors talked about football, but burning women remains taboo. Hanging women seems redundant, and so shooting her was more acceptable. The lethal police force did what lethal police force is told to do, and once done, another funeral, another grave. Another wave of disgust rises in the Texas streets like heat in July, it shimmers and shivers the doors and windows of offices where the doctors talk about football and sorrow and the indecent moaning of state lawmakers, their cries recall the voice of vultures after feasting. Mm. Last year, Mugabe finally was slightly released from office. Uh, but before he went, he put on a performance, defiant. Fruit from one vine tangles with another, making a mess of the intended harvest, yet the lack of calculation is welcome. That accident that shifts bodies from shadows into a locus of light, midday bright, and caustic wounds unhealed, newsreels, cameras trap, this old and angry man in a bespoke suit lifting white papers and refusing to read them, 
mumbles unwelcome threats and thanks the nation. The nation kicks him out. Finally, defiant after years of misrule, disruption, murder, and the choked voice youth terrorized. He wants more blood on his hands so that when he enters his version of paradise, all will be read. It really, 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 I'm so happy that he is no longer the head of that. And I keep thinking that might maybe that will happen to certain persons here. <laughs> All right, this is the other day I wrote this, and it's weird. And this is um, not published, and so it's a work in progress. Bonjour, Tristesse. I think Michael Lawley will like this. We'll see. Good morning, heartache is one way to greet the day. Poison drops in the cup of human kindness. Ignorance is health. Sweet days ahead, odd ways ahead. Life in a wood stove, heat gestates. Stealth climbers populate the codes. We are building Jacob's Ladder, and it is high and precarious. The moon, the moon just in reach. Teachers line up erasures, remove nouns, verbs languish by the water cooler. What wealth displayed here in daily violations, calculations, add up the sorrows, net the tears. Leave the singer's voice ragged and the velvet air smells like baby shit. And the last one is going to be a little different because the whole world does not revolve around Idiots in Washington. <laughs> All right. I, I really was in Cassis at Cliff Camargo Foundation. Thank you, the Bell Institute. Uh, and while I was there, Aretha Franklin had to tear and she decided to die on us. I'm still pissed. All right. <clears throat> but what can you do? She was old and tired and, and sick. Very, very sick. So, crying in Cassis for the Queen of Soul. Aretha Franklin, dead at 76. And this really is a work in progress. The Queen of Soul, breath gone on an August night, or was it early morning, near dawn? The Queen of Soul, whose reign was challenged by baby divas with scurrying voices, rose up, but they never got near to her throne. She was born a citizen of a nation that called brown people Queen and Duke and Earl and Count, but rarely citizen. Born citizen of a nation that found tongues loosened in a framed temples of justice, love, and recognizable rage. God's people vilified. God's people saved in rhythm, rhyme, time, kept better than the beating back of those who could not name the God they worshipped, Mammon or offer succor to anyone not like themselves. Voice travels across hearts' doors, which once open could not be closed. Voice travels deep in the hippocampus. I put that in because of Dr. Ford, y'all, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Voice travels deep in the, in the hippocampus, mocked and degraded. Open up and hear these words. Think. Respect, trouble, love, respect, love, think, 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 love. French voices shout in the bright late afternoon. The Mediterranean, the Mediterranean sparkles today. It will sparkle tomorrow. But the heavens, oh, they will sparkle like never before. The queen of soul, the voice that marked and framed a generation of citizens American, then global, soul in Dakar, Accra, Tunis, Johannesburg, Seoul in Marseille, Manchester, London, Paris, Berlin, on the radio, in Cologne, Santiago, Tokyo, and Chiang Mai. Her voice trails Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit. The migration in chords and harmonies, melodies memorable, choruses repeated, trails of tenderness and terror. Woman on the road, body loved, 
betrayed, slapped about, salved with new kisses. Woman on the road, queen of the train tracks, bus routes, plane rides, car trips, the great migrations, circles of motion, moving in her voice, a legacy. Her star matters brightly as Mars, so keen to be seen, this atom, battle weary, now resting. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Here's Jones. Rachel Haddis is the author of many books of poetry, essays, and translations. Her verse translations of Euripides, two plays about Iphigenia, are just out from Northwestern University Press, and poems for Camilla. It says, due out this fall, but I see it on the table here. It's from Measure Press, available. Uh, available on the uh, book table over here. The recipient of many awards. She teaches at Rutgers University, Newark. Please welcome Rachel Haddis. It's an honor to be one of these. It's an honor to be one of these voices. Thank you, Larissa, for putting this together. Great organizer, and thank you, Maggie. I, I, I love everything I'm hearing. I have sort of a backache, so I'm hobbling. I blame Trump totally. No, no one, no one has felt well for two years. You know, isn't that right? But we all feel a spark of hope in this extraordinary, totally extraordinary moment. I'm going to read two poems, one by me and one by someone else, but before that I want to bring in a couple of other voices. Not that long ago, in September uh, 2001, this poem by W.H. Auden was sort of circulating, and I'm just going to read one stanza of it, or see if I can recite it with one word change. This is September 1st, 1939, and if my math is right, that's almost 80 years ago. I sit in one of the dives on Cornelia Street, <laughs> uncertain and afraid, as the clever hopes expire of a low, dishonest decade, waves of anger and fear circulate over the bright and darkened lands of the earth, obsessing our private lives. The unmentionable odor of death um, offends the September night. I, I want to put another word than death in, the unmentionable odor of how do we begin to name what we've been inhaling for two years? It's dreadful. Death is okay, yeah, yeah, anyway. This is a good time to be with our friends and thank God for poetry. Um, the other thing I wanted to read quickly, there's a remarkable little anthology that came out in the spring of 2017 called Resistance Rebellion Life, um, 50 Poems Now, edited by Amit Majmudar, who is a physician poet in Ohio. I believe the New York Times was calling for poems, Nicholas Kristof was calling for poems of resistance. And um, I'm going to read a really short one by Kay Ryan, uh, partly because I disagree with it. I'm, I'm a big fan of Kay Ryan. This is called The Elephant in the Room. The room is almost all elephant. Almost none of it isn't. Pretty much solid elephant. So there's no room to talk about it. But that's not true, is it? I, I think that there is room to talk about it, but the elephant is why my back hurts, you know? Like we're feeling a, a weight, and everything that's been said about the state of emergency and what's at stake is totally right. Um, I'm going to read a poem by a poet some of you will be familiar with, Alicia Stallings, one of the best young American poets. And she lives in Athens and has been working with refugees there since 2015. She has a poem in the new New York Review, but I'm going to read another one from her amazing new book, Like, called Empathy, because one of the tortures of our time is that with our inborn human qualities of compassion, not everyone has it, but most of us come hardwired with compassion, we think about all the suffering around us, and then we feel guilty and helpless. It's, um, it's a kind of a loop. And this, this is a poem about the refugees who were drowning in the Aegean, but it has an interesting twist. Empathy is a word that's easy to use lightly. 
So I'm going to read that, and then I'll read a new poem of mine. <laughs> Empathy. My love, I'm grateful tonight. Our listing bed isn't a raft precariously adrift as we dodge the Coast Guard light and clasp hold of a girl and a boy. I'm glad we didn't wake our kids in the thin hours to take not a thing, not a favorite toy, and didn't hand over our cash to one of the smuggling rackets that we didn't buy cheap life jackets no better than bright orange trash and less buoyant. I'm glad that the dark above us is not deeply twinned beneath us and moiled with wind, and we don't scan the sky for a mark, any mark, that demarcates a shore as the dinghy starts taking on water. I'm glad that our six-year-old daughter who can't swim is a foot off the floor in the bottom bunk and our son with his broken arms high and dry, that the ceiling is not seeping sky with our journey but hardly begun. Empathy isn't generous, it's selfish. It's not being nice to say I would pay any price not to be those who die to be us. Another voice, I won't, I won't recite it, and I couldn't bring a heavy Shakespeare, but this has been going around the internet. In Shakespeare's problem comedy, Measure for Measure, the Duke, the Duke of Vienna wants to have sex with a woman in exchange for sparing her brother's life, and she says, I'll expose you, you hypocrite. And there's an amazing speech. He begins, who will believe thee, Isabel? My untouched life, my great CV, you know. It is an amazing passage. And I, part of me wants to say nothing is new under the sun and we've been through all this before. But it, the urgency doesn't stop. I think it's act three, scene four of Measure for Measure, but I, people can look it up. And this is a, um, a dream slash nightmare poem from last summer called Shouldering. I, I've not read it before, so I might stumble. The dream bird father sitting on my shoulder is singing in my ear. Now that you're older than I was when I left the rocky road, it is your turn to shoulder the load, answer questions students need to ask. You are an elder now. You wear the mask of wisdom, so you tell them. Tell them what? The song breaks off. In somebody's back seat, a baby. Whose? More babies on the border. Terror, desperation, rage, disorder of crowded house, tap leaking, family, students leaning in to question me. Where should we go now? Tell us what to do. The road's uphill, and that is all I know. Borrowing, burrowing, stirring the dark stew, blended broth of night visions and day, instructions garbled, watchmen standing tall and menacing at gates along a wall. Gaps in the rampart, raw red border zone. Children wake and cry along the line. The students' questions pound relentlessly. Dream father, bird of omen, oh tell me. The lost, the hungry, the abandoned, who will take care of them? The grown-ups knew the answers to these questions, and now we are the grown-ups. Whose job is it to know? The reassuring elders, where are they? The dream bird looks at me and hops away. Always uphill, the steep road, poetry, scattered syllables still in my ear when I sit up, and the red world is here. Thank you. to say thank you again for showing up and you know the time is shorter now for small talk so you get in the elevator you can say hello how are you getting to your polling place and <laughs> thank you for voting you know, I know you'll show up and let's help others show up and um, and Larissa prepared all this information for you and when you know it you can pass it along to somebody else 
I want to thank Gio Geller as well for showing up and filming this. Where's Gio? Ah, Gio. Hello, thank you, Gio. Team for Gio. Our final reader. Elaine Equi teaches at New York University and in the MFA program in creative writing at the New School. Widely published and anthologized, her work has appeared in the American Poetry Review, The Nation, The New Yorker, Tin House Poetry, and in many editions of The Best American Poetry. Welcome, Jesus. Elaine Equi. a great reading. I am enjoying it so much. I almost hate to read. I've been listening and enjoying it, but now it's my turn. Um, I'm going to start with a poem about voting. It's a manifesto. It's the only manifesto I've ever written, and it's called Manifesto. It's after Andre Breton, because I was reading his manifesto of surrealism when I wrote it. When I dream, I vote. Exercise my rights as citizen of the dream state to terraform the future. Work to abolish the most abject poverty of all, that of knowing only one world. Activists, lovers, don't just entwine your bodies, but also dreams. When you sleep together, go all the way. <laughs> So I especially wanted to read this poem because of everything I've ever written. This had a kind of a brush with history. It was um, published in The Nation the week of November 8, 2008, when Obama got elected for the first term. And it was just such a joyful, transformative, magical moment that I thought if there's any residue, any echo at all left of that in the poem, I wanted to redirect it toward the midterms. <laughs> so, yeah. This is another dream poem. It's called Pluralism. I find myself in a crooked place, gnarled, branching out, standing beneath the sky clothed in bark. I dreamt I must have slept. I was a tree, one of many dwelling in this high rise, looking at starry lights from the penthouse. I was not alone. The word tree is not singular. <laughs> Scared for trees. <laughs> this is called um, Why. It's a list of reasons why I write. <laughs> I write to impersonate words and give them a more human quality. I write so I can taste test a word for myself. I write to discover what can only be said in the moment, because it is, no matter how stupid or obvious that sounds. I write because it's an inexpensive habit, except in terms of time. I write because I can't sing. <laughs> it's true. I write to embellish facts. I write to spite an old nun who punished me for telling the truth by having me write, I will not tell lies 100 times. <laughs> I write because certain combinations of words really are magical. I write to create a body of work. I write to converse with the dead and pay my respects to the unborn. I write to procrastinate and avoid not writing. <laughs> this is called Phantom Anthem. I'll know my country when I seize it, like Columbus on the way to someplace else, and set my foot upon its cloud. Oh, how solemn a business is the relentless pursuit of happiness as if it were a fugitive from the law. Now its flag is a teacup on an anvil, now a grasshopper on a field of stars. But when I see the adorable children of celebrities on play dates, my joy is irrefutable. 
Only my denim is a distress. <laughs> and when I witness how tenderly old and young cradle their guns and speak in the shadow of ancient words like freedom, well, it never fails to bring a tear. So that's an old poem, but sadly still relevant. I look forward to the day when I can retire it. Uh, this is a newer poem. I think you'll recognize this trend. It's called Retail Space for Rent. Right? Every day emptiness erases big franchises as well as small boutiques. The place that sold gadgets. The shop that specialized in hats. It's a commercial version of the rapture. Leaving behind a jigsaw puzzle of blank pieces. Each one an unopened invitation to anyone with an ounce of creative vision and the millions needed to back it up. If this were a movie, aliens would be arriving to set up their ministry. But today, even the sky seems vacant. We're dissolving the past faster than we can manufacture the future. Lots of everything must go, not enough coming soon. This is a poem complaining about technology, something, if you know me, that I often do. It's called, We Don't Need Another Psychic. <laughs> we don't need another psychic to tell us we're fucked. Who would buy a record of every stupid question we ever asked? A list of every drug we've ever taken. A catalog of all the miracle products we bought that never worked the sex toys we abandoned in some corner of a drawer. Apparently, there are people who collect these things. Well, to each his own. But what I would really like to see money poured into is the development of anti-ESP. I'm talking less mind reading, more minding your own business. <laughs> I don't want to have to use a multi-platform verification system that requires three different devices to open a piece of spam. We need better places to hide our innate incendiary value. Like poems, for example. Nobody would think to look there. <laughs> and the last poem I'm going to read is called The Intangibles. Step right up and speak into the void. Prove you are not a robot. Answer the question. What color is the silver basket? Enter the sequence of numbers written in the sky. Look past the dazzling confounds. Move to the high percolations at the edge of. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Elaine Equi. And again, thank you all for coming here tonight. And I feel really jazzed, and I feel like you've really inspired me to oh, just not think that all the world is wilderness. So thank you very much. Thanks. Round of applause for you so much. Books on the table. Oh, yes. And one additional thing, we are, as I mentioned, we filmed this, and uh, the poems and probably the film of the poem, of a screening is going to be archived at Stanford. Thank you all.